And for those of you who don't know me, a little bit about my background. Um, I have been at University of Iowa for about two years now. Um, I work uh, with Sean O'Hara at the University of Iowa Museum of Art. My background specialty is African art, and I've been working with digital mapping projects um, probably for about seven or eight years now. I started as a research assistant at the beginning of my PhD um, with my advisor who was involved with developing the world map uh, platform that I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Um, so as I go along, if you have any questions about anything I'm talking about, um, please feel free to interject. That's one of the wonderful things I think about this space is there's a certain amount of casualness which is really possible. So please feel free to jump in. Um, but what I'm going to do is look at four different things. First, I'm going to introduce you to the world map platform for anyone who isn't familiar with it. Just take a few minutes to go over it and why we're using it and kind of what the possibilities are there. Talk a little bit more specifically about the University of Iowa Museum of Art mapping project that I'm working on um, and how that's fitting with, with world map. And then I'm going to look at how these things can sort of transition into other platforms. And the example I'll use today is Google Earth, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and from there, I'm going to finish up giving you kind of a sneak peek at a project that I'm working on right now uh, with maybe you may know Christopher Roy in the School of Art and Art History and his Art and Life in Africa uh, project which was originally developed in the 1990s, uh, and it was a massive project popular across North America with the K-12 audience as well as universities were using it as an education uh, in the cultures of Africa as well as African art, but it was developed on a CD-ROM that was compatible with Windows 95. Uh, so you can imagine that it probably hasn't been in use for a few years, and so it's chock full of data, and one of the things that Chris and I are working on is making all of that data publicly accessible for free to basically the widest audience possible. So I'm going to look at that and then also how that's going to be integrated with the GIS mapping technology that I'm working on. All right. Any questions so far? Okay. Well, one of the questions I get from people is, okay, it's, it's glitzy, it's glammy, there's all kinds of things, and I suspect I may be preaching to the choir since you've come to hear a GIS talk today. You probably already have an interest. But a lot of people say, why does this matter? Why is it important? Why do you want to do this? And one of the things that I say, which is that, I mean, admittedly, again, you're, you, you may fall into this camp as well, um, but I'm a self-declared nerd. I find just about everything fascinating. And that's one of the reasons I actually ended up studying art history, was because when I was younger and I started in, in college, I thought, well, wait a second, no, I want, to, I want to do English, no, I want to do science, no, wait a second, maybe I should go to med school. And then, you know, I happened upon, in, in my first year of university, I took an art history class. And the reason I signed up, to be honest, was because I knew there was a lot of field trips to museums, and to me, that was fantastic. And what I didn't realize was that this was a discipline that you could study, and people would even pay you to do things related to it. Um, and that's sort of how I fell in love with art history. But as I come to it now, in being part of an academic community and thinking about how that functions, it makes a lot of sense to integrate something like art history or art objects with a project like GIS and with the wider academic community. Because part of the reason that I love these objects is because you can use an art object to look at science. You can use it to look at literature. You can use it to look at political science history. And in a lot of ways, I think for students and for different learners, there's an element of that art object. It's almost like a cheat sheet. I used to think about that. We had slide tests in art history, and they would put up a picture, and I think, well, all the answers are in the picture, you know? Because it's there. There's answers, and there's, there's pieces of information. And I think that what I'm going to go through today is showing how that transitions into this GIS project, why that's kind of a logical connection, and how it can use, be used not just for art history students, but for interdisciplinarity across the university. So let me see if I can put my first slide up here. Okay, so what I've done here is I've actually created a little video, and then I'm going to attempt to narrate over top of the video, because I find sometimes if I do too much clicking that I'm not paying enough attention to the audience. So we'll see how it goes. 
Okay, so I'm going to actually talk so you don't just sit here and watch me while you hear my voice. Um, but this is the, the University of Iowa Museum of Art mapping project, and as I mentioned, we're using the World Map platform, which is out of Harvard. So right now, we are looking at just the introductory screen. This is what you land on if you go to it. And this is available to the public right now. I made the painful decision, um, as we talked about, these things are a work in progress with technology, things go wrong. Um, and let me pause it for a second while I yammer at you. Uh, one of the things that I decided to do was actually make it publicly accessible while we're working on it. To facilitate the possibility of people giving us feedback right away and saying, you know what, I got on there, there's this link that's not working, or you know, I'm finding the, the titles on your legend are a little bit difficult to read. And for anyone who's a perfectionist, you know how painful that is to sort of put your, your mistakes right out there in public. But I think, again, in thinking about as we move forward in academia, part of what this kind of thing and these kind of platforms facilitate is more of a collaborative working on a project. So I may be leading the project, but what you think about it and your feedback is extremely valuable. So you'll notice as we look at this map right now, that you can see that there's a number of different objects that are georeferenced uh, to their points of origin. You see a bunch of colored lines, and I'm going to show you in a minute exactly what that is. Um, and you can see my little mouse is going to move over there and click off the layer so you can see as a starting point. Has anyone here used World Map before? Okay, so you've got a few people, but just for those of you who haven't, essentially you start with a blank map. And then all of these layers over here, you add them. You can create them. You can pull them in from different data sources. I mean, some of this stuff, let me just pause it again. Some of this stuff here, when you're looking at the map layers, we've got um, projects, Aluka heritage locations. We have ethnolinguistic linguistic groups. We have a slave trade project. That's pulling out of actually a partnership between Emory University and a university. I think it's either Australia and New Zealand. So we're pulling their data in, which is again, I mean, you've got a worldwide resource. You've got people with brilliant minds working on things all around the world. Well, how can we tap into that? How can we link it up to what we're doing at Iowa to not only benefit what we're doing, but to share what we're doing with those communities as well? So I will show you as I go along sort of what are the things we're adding in there, how does this work? Am I jumping too far out of the camera frame? We're okay? Okay. So keep going here. Okay, so just while we're talking here, we've got these uh, objects from the University of Iowa collections. And the idea is, again, as I'm talking about, I rigged up a couple of demos, but the long-term goal is to have these pieces, all of the pieces in our collection on the map. And we've started with Africa. So you can see we've clicked on this, and this is an example of if you're a student, say you're doing a project in the art history department, and you're looking at this object. Well, one of the things you might wonder about is, what is the uh, cultural group that this object came from? Well, this is something you can start to explore using this map. So you zoom in, and actually you can go over, there's an a, a area of the map called Ethno and Linguistic Groups, and I've pulled in a map uh, by Felix de Muir called Ethnicity, and we'll click on that, and you can see that it shows up as a layer with that object on the map. We start to zoom in, and so again, as I mentioned, joining this data with projects that other people have put together, and you can see that it's the Gola, and the Vi people. So you know that this object originated from the Gola and the Vi people. And you can pull that opacity up if you're having a little bit of difficulty seeing it, and you can see it a little bit more clearly here. And you can change that with all the different layers. We'll close that. And then if I want to learn a little more about it, I can click on there. And right now it's linking through Picasso. We're trying to um, look at different ways, and this is one of the ways we're, we've put um, uh, objects on is through Picasso and created a link to the website which my internet self clicked on and then we can scroll down and you see it links right to our website and it's got additional information and one of the things if you're a student who's wondering about this object and you're thinking about it one of the things you're going to find out when you read this information is that it was created around the year it was about circa 1915 so if you go back to the map and you say okay well what was happening in the world around 1915 and you can scroll down and you see there are period maps. And sure enough, there's the closest one to be about 1900, so let's put that on there and click it. And you can see that this red line appears around that area. 
And if you go in, and I think I take off the other layers so we can have a little bit of a closer look, you can see that it's right inside that red boundary. So if you click inside that boundary, you can look up here and you see 1900, the British were in control of Sierra Leone. So kind of giving some historical context to that and thinking about what that means. As I can tell you as an art history student, that's very significant. But it also has you know, implications across a variety of other disciplines as well. So you start to look a little bit closer, knowing that information, you start to look at this mask and start thinking about it. You think, you know, that's really interesting because this mask was created in Sierra Leone at a time where British were in control. And doesn't the headdress have certain links and parallels with coronation symbolism? You know, and as a student, it's part of what this is about. It was interesting when I first got to the University of Iowa, I went around and I was talking to a lot of different faculty about how they were using the visual classroom, how they were using the Museum of Art collections. And for me, as a person who studies African art, the idea of context is really important. We want people to understand you know, where an object came from, how it's linked to different things. As I mentioned earlier, part of that interdisciplinary, for me, is what makes African art so fascinating. But what horrified me was that when I spoke to faculty, they said, you know, when they're up in the museum or in the visual classroom on campus, we do not want uh, extended labels. We don't want, essentially, quote unquote, the answers pinned to the wall. And so after my jaw dropped and I, you know, thought about it, you can, I'll put it on pause for a second, um, thought about it, you know, what are, what are they saying? And so I talked around to, to a, a kind of a swath of faculty on campus in a number of different disciplines, and I was getting the same kind of answers to say, you know, people are thinking differently, they're learning differently now, and what I want as an academic instructor is for students to go in and to ask questions. I want them to start recognizing historical patterns. I want them to see connections between things they may not necessarily have identified previously. And so, to me, that's one of the things that actually GIS technology makes really possible, really, uh, uh, really prominently, is taking things that may seem disparate, like why does a student, why should they care that the British were in control of Sierra Leone in 1915 or 1900, as, as we saw on the map? Well, because that has significant implications. You know, for an art history student, obviously, now, another type of data that um, I don't have on the video here, but I'll show you a little bit later, is you know, taking it beyond that is, how does this apply to someone, for example, in the field of medicine? Well, one of the other layers on here um, is looking at the prevalence of female circumcision. And one of the things I'll show you in our next segment is that where this mask was created sits in an area where the female circumcision rate is 91.3%. Well, if you're a student who's going to go, maybe you're in the medical school and you're going to do a Doctors Without Borders, why should you care about one of the objects in the University of Iowa Museum of Art and understand its significance relative to the wider community? Well, because it's going to inform your medical practice, it's going to give you additional knowledge about an issue like female circumcision that is actually rooted in cultural norms and practices, and part of that is linked up with objects that we have in our collection. So something to kind of think about. And I can give you another example as we go along. I'll do one more. How are we doing for time here? Um, and show you, OK, so not even thinking about art history. Let's think about the literature department. So you're a student, and you've been assigned to read Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. Uh, well, one of the things I'm going to, on here, once we see the objects disappear, it should pop up. Uh, one of the things, too, to think about with this is that we're creating these at the Museum of Art. But part of what we want to do as well is make it possible for faculty to take the data we're developing, to take the objects that we're geo-referencing and mix that with their own work as well and create their own maps if they so choose or have students creating maps. So you can see I'm searching, I'm a student, I'm reading this book, I look in Google and I say, tell me about Chinua Chebe things fall apart. Well, one of the first things I'm going to see is that it's an um, English language novel by Nigerian author Chinua Achebe, and it was published in 1958. Okay, well, I'm going to go back to the University of Iowa Museum of Art Mapping Project, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer. I know it's set in Nigeria, and I know that the people who are featured in the novel are called the Ibo, and that it's spelled I-B-O. But where the heck in Nigeria do they live? I want to find that out. So I go to my ethnographic and my, my ethnolinguistic groups, and I can look. I have a variety of different layers to choose from. 
And as I expand it out here, you'll see that I have one from 1959. Well, that's pretty close to 1958, so I'm going to add that layer to the map. And then I can go down here and I can search IBO and hit search. And it's going to show me where the Igbo people live in Nigeria. So one of the things, if you've ever studied African art, and I've taught it, uh, and I know that my students are always frustrated by the fact that terminology can often shift and change over the years. So one of the things that you might look at if you're a student say, okay, I know I have to look up, up books on the Igbo, but are there any different spellings? Well, if I look here, I have my map from 1959, and then if I go and I look at the list, and I know I have one from 2001, um, there we go, click on there. My internet self is very slow. <laughs> okay. And you can see I can bring up the opacity of that 2001, and sure enough, in the exact same area, I see that Igbo is spelled I-G-B-O. Um, so that's just another example of the different ways that this can be applicable. And sure enough, if I go back and I add my UIMA object demo, there is the UIMA's Igbo, speaking ma Igbo Maiden Spirit Mask, which is currently on display in the visual classroom. So if I read the book and I say, you know, they keep making reference to these maiden spirits. What are those? Well, I can go to the University of Iowa Museum of Art and I can actually look at one up close and I can see how, you know, in reading that book, it brings a way to bring all of these different things together. And as a student, you start to become aware of how much is accessible to you, how much you can get, even just on the Iowa campus alone. Um, part of the reason that we're, we're using the world map platform is that it's openly accessible, it's free. You can not only create your own layers, but you can um, share them with other people. One of my priorities as a curator of African art at the University of Iowa Museum of Art, we have one of the best collections of African art in North America. And one of the things I would like to do is figure out ways to connect those collections, not only to our own students, but to the communities of people who are living and working across the African continent. And so a platform like WorldMap, part of what it makes it possible by being free, by being accessible to a wider community, is you can actually collaborate with people. I could have someone who's in Ghana using their mobile phone to upload you know, uh, uh, someone carving a stool that I can then pair with an image of stools from the University of Iowa collections and then possibly also link in an essay that a student here has written to. So there's a lot of possibility here, a lot of different connections. Um, Again, if you are a user of any kind of technology, one of the things you know too is that things come and go and they do it very quickly. Uh, so one of our concerns in developing our project has been thinking about, you know, where, what's this going to look like in two years, five years, ten years? Um, and with GIS technology, there's so many different platforms that the way we wanted to develop our project is to make sure that whatever we create is something that can be transferable. So it can be taken from a platform like WorldBat, it can be exported, and it can be brought into a program, for example, like Google Earth. Um, Google Earth recently has had some developments that makes it possible to do kind of more and more interesting things. And I will actually bring up my own Google Earth here and show you. So everything you're going to look at here, I exported from WorldMap and imported into Google Earth. One of the reasons we didn't start by using WorldMap or uh, Google Earth was because of the fact that you have to, in order to use it, you have to download a program. You have to be willing to, and I, I know from our experience with people using the, the Art Museum website, that as soon as you ask them to download something on their computer, everyone says, ooh, I don't know. You know but then there's other people who are, die-hard Google Earth enthusiasts. So part of what we want to do, as I said, is create something that we can, use, can be used across a variety of different platforms. So you can see this is where I'm going to have to do a little bit of talking into the corner here, so bear with me. Um, but you can see, let's see if we can find our, our lady who we were looking at before. So this is the same thing that was in the other one. And here, I mean, it's not always quite as pretty, to be honest, in the, the translation of some of the data, but you can get a lot of the same stuff and then you can clean it up once it's in there. So you can see it still makes the link. And as I mentioned earlier, you remember the female circumcision rate. Well, let me take off the ethno-linguistic groups for a second. Turn on the female circumcision rates uh, map that I was telling you about. And you can see here 
And if I zoom in, and there is our piece that we were looking at. And if I click on here and I scroll down, you can see that it says the total is 91.3% is the female circumcision rate. And then it breaks it down into urban and to rural. So again, the data, depending on how it's been inputted from the partner group, it's not always going to be as pretty as we would like it to be, particularly from an art museum perspective, where we think aesthetics are very important. Um, but a lot of times, as we're developing a project like this, in order to get the nitty gritty done, to get it out there, get people using it, get them giving us feedback, well, we can make it available when it's not quite as perfect as we might like it to be. But you can see how with um, this, you, I mean, you've got all of these objects there um, in the exact same kind of um, geo-reference to their points of origin, so students can look at the relationships that these have to one another. They can click on the links and be brought up to, um, uh, to the website so that they can kind of learn a little bit more about it. And again, they can start asking those questions because as you saw on that earlier map, there's so many, I mean, you can look at soil type, you can look at water bodies, you can look at Wikipedia, you can add YouTube. I mean, you name it, you can add it. So whether you teach art history or whether you teach political science or something completely different, there's ways to bring that together. And of course, in my humble opinion as an art museum curator, at the center of that, is an object which can really navigate those different areas and show the intersections in a way that's very prominent. So I'll close up Google Earth unless anyone has any questions about that, but you can just kind of get a sense of how it works. So let me just, as we're wrapping up here, I think I've got a few more minutes to give you an idea of a kind of sneak peek into what we're doing with the Art and Life in Africa project. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a project that Christopher Roy was involved with uh, in the 1990s. He brought together more than 30 of the leading scholars in the field of African arts and culture and had them contribute essays, contribute their own field photographs, contribute objects from various art museum collections into one project that sort of brings all of this information together and allows us to kind of explore. And it was targeted for a kind of K-12 or an undergraduate or a college audience of having people be able to kind of start to understand. I mean, when I was teaching African art, I would start every lecture and say, if you walk away from knowing one thing from this class, know that Africa is a continent, not a country. Um, and you would be shocked the number of students whose jaws dropped when I said that. Um, because one of the things I think that was a kind of a goal of Chris's project originally was to really celebrate that diversity, give people a sense of what is in, what, what, what happens across the African continent? What is the cultures? It, you know, and, and I say cultures because it's dynamic. I mean, we're talking about different geographies, different climates, mountain ranges, deserts, you know. So how do you bring that all together and kind of look at it? So he brought it together in a kind of coherent CD-ROM uh, that then became sort of inaccessible. And what we're now doing is shifting that and making it available because what we're doing is twofold. So the first stage of the project, which we're working on right now, is taking all of the data from Chris's Art and Life in Africa project, allowing scholars an opportunity to update it. Um, you know, it's been a few years since 1995. Um, but at the same time, a lot of this information is still really valuable, but people want to make additions or changes. So we're going through that process, and then we're presenting it as a wider website. So phase one is to change that CD-ROM into a, a freely accessible website. And then stage two is to map that data so it becomes accessible in a slightly different way. It's, it's part of what I was talking about earlier was thinking about that different learning styles, the different ways that people are kind of navigating things now, right? With a CD-ROM, you were kind of telling a story. You were starting one and you were moving to the end. But as we know now, anybody who's doing research, you know people hop in and out of documents, you know that they move around, they may not read the whole thing. And so part of what we're doing with the digital mapping project is kind of going at it from both directions. On the one hand, you can still, there's a sort of kind of a narrative format to the structure of the website. But on the other hand, when we've got the GIS mapping project, it kind of will break down the data into its component parts and allow people, in effect, to rearrange it in new ways so that they can start thinking about it differently, that they can see connections that maybe weren't part of that initial narrative. So again, it's about opening up, making it more accessible, and getting people in there to do different things. So just to give you, this is just a, a little 
kind of introductory page. And as I said, I, this is a demo I kind of put together uh, to show you guys how this functions. And you can see that I brought in some of those period maps just to show you that, again, you can bring in data from all different sources. And part of what this is going to be is bringing in all the art and life in Africa uh, data, but then at the same time bringing in from a bunch of different sources and saying, great, okay, we've got this fantastic project. How can we bring in what everybody else is doing too? Because then it's just going to be unstoppable. And as a resource for faculty and students, I mean, like I said, whether you're in one department or another, you can find something in there, you can connect the information in different ways, and then whatever you create then becomes a learning tool for people as well to start really kind of expanding the ways we think about things. So just as an example, um, one of the things that, uh, I'll just take some of the other layers off to focus on a few things at the moment. One of the things that the Art and Life in Africa project includes are essays written by scholars kind of from various different locations. And you can see that when you click on one, a little thing comes up. And then I'll say, OK, take me to the essay. And this is going to take me to the Art and Life in Africa website. And this is not available yet. Just for your reference, I'll take a minute to kind of introduce you. And you'll see there'll be a few kind of wonky things as we're looking at the screen. It's because probably as we speak, my curatorial research assistant is actually uh, working so hard to upload all of the data from that original project. Um, I get the lucky job of coming out and using the glossy screen to tell you guys about it. Um, but he's doing a lot of work uh, on the back end to make that possible. Um, so what you can see, anyone who remembers Chris's project, I don't know if any of you had used it um, back in the day. So this may, some of the content may look familiar, um, but the sort of the shape of it looks a lot different. Um, and the way, as I mentioned with the CD-ROM, it was set up in a very narrative format where it went in chapters and you moved your way through it. Well, here we've continued to have those chapters so people can follow that if they want to, but if they want to hop around, they can do that as well. Um, so then we have the topic essays, as I showed you already. So these are written by leading scholars in the field of African arts and culture. And one of the things we're making available how it was built in the 1990s initially, but part of the plan of this longer term project is actually to continue to build it. So invite scholars to continue working on this, to bring in new content, bring in new collections, and really continue to build it as a resource. That is, I mean, one of the amazing things, I recently have been working on a bibliography from one of the uh, publishing houses, and one of the things they talked about when they were writing to me to ask me to do it was, you know, people are not using information in the same ways, and we need people to be able to come into the middle of your bibliography, read a, a source, and then go out and go somewhere else. And we also want to create it so that a year from now, you can add additional sources. And then you can come back a decade from now and say, you know what, I'm continuing to, to research, and I know that someone just wrote this really great book. And so we're taking that philosophy and applying it similarly to the Art and Life in Africa project. So it becomes really dynamic in the ways that it's used. And again, because we make it to the, available to the public and we don't say, you know, this is a complete project, you can come to us and say, you know, I'm teaching a course on fill in the blank. And I really would love to have some content. Well, and we would say, great, you know, as long as you've given us some significant lead time. How can we identify a scholar who can produce that, invite them to contribute to this, so it starts to build and starts to serve uh, not only us, but then the wider uh, community? Because as I said, this is available not only to Iowa, but around the globe. OK. And the other thing, of course, we're art historians. So uh, photographs are very important to us, and, and art objects. And so that's another aspect of the project that's really important, is it brings together uh, African collections from across North America and globally as well into a single resource. Um, and so again, this is sort of kind of reshaping the way we think about it. And then if we go back and look at a demo of how that kind of functions, you can see we put the art objects on the map. You know, you choose it. You can see that an image comes up. You can look at that object. But if you want to look at it in more detail, it links up with the website. And as you can see, the website includes substantial data about that. And so we'll be kind of building that resource. And again, it kind of what the mapping project does, what the GIS component does, is it not only makes it possible for us to draw in data from a range of sources and link up with a variety of different disciplines, but it also makes us it makes it possible for us to reorient the information in a way that facilitates 
people asking interesting questions, people thinking about things in new ways, rather than you know just going to the museum, seeing what it says on the wall and saying, yep, that's what that object does. Instead, we want students to go in, or audience members to go in and say, hmm, wait a second, I saw that object, but I think it just might have a relationship with this other thing that I've been thinking about and that I saw as I was looking at it. So these are some things to think about. I'm going to wrap up because it's quarter after one, and I know you guys probably have some places to go, or you may even have some questions. Um, so I'll finish up there, but I welcome any feedback. And as you follow our project, this Art and Life in Africa project will actually launch in the spring. We have an exhibition that's going to open alongside of it. And part of the idea behind that is that the exhibition, which will be in the Black Box Theater, it opens in February, I believe the 22nd, will have the physical objects from uh, the, the online website. So students, faculty member, visitors will actually be able to stand in the space, look at the object, and they can look up online. Uh, we're still exploring, uh, one of the things we've made sure about the website is that it's adaptable to tablets and to phones. So you could actually be standing there on your iPhone in the space, looking up the information while you are actually looking at the object. One of the concerns that I hear again and again with art historians is if you put it on the internet, no one will go to the museum. And I would argue that it's actually the opposite. For me, as a, as a student, when I knew something was somewhere, you know, I found out, you know, something happened to be in the collections of the National Museum of Ireland that, you know, no one had ever seen. I was on my, you know, on the point headed there to see the thing in person. Um, there's something I think really gratifying, especially I remember in undergrad, when I read about something in a book and I got to go to the museum and see it. You know, there was, there's something really real and really important about that. And so this isn't intended, our GIS mapping, our technology isn't intended as a replacement, but more as a facilitator, a way to, as I said, expand and integrate the way we're thinking about things in a really kind of interdisciplinary way. So thank you. <laughs>